Welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us again. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Anthony Blyer this morning. He's a nephrologist at Wake Forest uh, Baptist Health in North Carolina and also the co-author of a study on Christexa in dialysis patients with advanced renal disease and uncontrolled gout. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Anthony Blyer. Thank you very much. I really am happy to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Well, as a nephrologist, uh, give our listeners a bit of your background, and then let's talk about this study. Sure. So I went to uh, medical school at Baylor College of Medicine, and I did my residency at Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and my fellowship at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And then I, I joined the nephrology faculty at Wake Forest, where I've been for over 25 years. And uh, initially, I started studied the epidemiology of end-stage kidney disease, uh, but then started studying the genetics of uh, rare causes of inherited kidney disease and gout. And so um, in this study, I was able to, we were able to combine two things that I'm interested in. One is epidemiology and another is um, gout. And so gout is, most gout is caused by decreased excretion of uric acid in the urine and by problems with the kidney. So a lot of people who have gout have chronic kidney disease. And as chronic kidney disease worsens, unfortunately, some patients will end up receiving uh, and, and needing dialysis. And then it can become a problem because patients with uncontrolled gout, they can end up on dialysis. And then how do we treat these patients? And um, the treatments are actually limited. Some of the treatments we have very little um uh, experience with. And another problem that we have is that some people will uh, come to dialysis and they'll have severe gout. And so then how do we treat this, especially the severe form of gout? And uh, so in this study, what we looked at was this uh, medicine called piglotocase. And what piglotocase does is it metabolizes uric acid. And uh, piglotocase is a very effective intravenous therapy uh, for hyperuricemia and gout. And uh, so piglotocase has been used in uh, many patients with normal kidney function and some with chronic kidney disease. Uh, but we were really trying to get some uh, data about real-world use of piglotocase in dialysis patients. Uh, we had done a previous study looking at the um, kinetics of piglotocase in dialysis um, but this is the first study where we were able to look at patients who had received dialysis and were on piglotocase. So what were some of the major takeaways from the study? Um, so I think the major takeaways, so first of all, we were dealing with data from the United States Renal Data System. And so in a, like in a lot of large epidemiologic studies, we can't get all the data that we want, and we have to work with the data that's available. Um, so what we were able to find was that there were 42 patients who were identified as having received piglotocase after starting dialysis. And nine patients, 21%, had received at least 12 infusions of piglotocase. So they had received it a number of times. Um, so while we don't have data saying about its efficacy, we can usually say that piglotocase is very effective in lowering uric acid levels. And if these 21% of the patients received at least 12 infusions, this means it was well tolerated in this group of patients and effective. And this would be consistent with our um, earlier study looking at the kinetics of piglotocase, which looked like it would be uh, helpful in, uh, uh, or it would be okay to use in patients who are on dialysis. Do you think that this is going to greatly uh, alter clinicians treating dialysis patients? I don't think it, I think it will have some effect. Mm -hmm. um, I think the major the major point uh, for me that I'd like to impart to your listeners today is that gout is treatable, and there's really no one who needs to suffer from gout because we have therapies that are available, mm -hmm. and these therapies range from drugs that we've used for many years like allopurinol um, to newer drugs like Cristexa and uh, piglotocase. Uh, and so with the with these medicines, I think every patient now should be able to be treated with gout. We should not have patients who have recurrent painful gout uh, that is not receiving treatment. And I think that nephrologists are a good point uh, person, 
are good point persons for patients on dialysis who have, like, have gout that we're interested in treating with paglotocase. A rheumatologist are also really helpful in this. But I think the most important thing for me is that if you have a patient with untreated gout, or, or I shouldn't say untreated, but with gout that's not responding to therapy, uh, you should refer them to a rheumatologist or a nephrologist or someone who can help with therapy. And also that we found in this study that patients who are on these medicines, um, that the Christexa can be uh, well tolerated on dialysis. For such a treatable condition, why do you think more people or more nephrologists or specialists aren't aware of how treatable gout is? So I think the reason, um, I think one reason that we don't treat gout as effectively as we could is because for centuries, you know, we've kind of thought of gout as this disease of uh, people who don't eat well. You know, we've had caricatures of patient or, or individuals who are, you know, eating this meal with lobster and steak and drinking wine and beer and you know, that this was the cause of gout. And sometimes we laugh off gout as, you know, something that uh, people are doing, that are experiencing because of their diet. But in reality, 80% of gout is due to chronic kidney disease. And a lot of these patients are not experiencing single episodes of gout, but recurrent attacks. Many times the patients aren't coming to the doctor with each attack of gout. And uh, many times the patients are, are going uh, to doctors who don't have experience with dosing uh, medications uh, for gout and chronic kidney disease. And uh, so I think these are the reasons um, that a lot of people, the gout is untreated. And this is really why I think if you have a patient who has gout and um, it's not responding to the therapy that you're giving, really consider referring to a rheumatologist or to a nephrologist uh, to help with its care. Now, you've talked about the suffering uh, that's associated with gout and also the, the cause, but what are some of the symptoms, briefly, of gout? Do they affect the bones, the joints, uh, the skin? What are the uh, symptoms that people should be aware of? Well, thank you. That's a really good question. And so uh, the the most common symptom uh, that patients ex, uh, ex, um, uh, have uh, is that they get a painful swollen joint. A lot of times that's in the big toe. It's called podagra if it occurs in the big toe. Uh, but it can occur also on the top of the foot, uh, in the ankle, or in the knee. These are really common uh, sites for gout. And uh, the joint usually gets very red, and uh, patients have these symptoms where they say they can't even put a sheet on top of their toe uh, because it's so painful. Um, now, after patients have had several attacks of gout, sometimes the gout pain can become chronic. So we might miss it because they're having pain like almost all the time. And even though uh, gout occurs in these joints, you can also have uric acid deposition in other areas throughout the body um, uh, where we may not even have symptoms. So the primary symptoms are just really uh, acute pain and uh, swelling and redness of usually one or maybe two joints at one time. And the pain usually responds to uh, therapy with medications like um, non-steroidals or prednisone. Where can our listeners go online and learn some more about the uncontrolled gout and possibly about the study that we've been talking about uh, involving Christexa today? So I think a good place to start with would be kidney.org. That's the National Kidney Foundation site. And they'll have a link to their spring clinical meetings, and they'll have information about this study. Other sites that are good, you can also always go to the Mayo Clinic site uh, to learn about gout, as well as goutrevealed.com, uh, which talks about um, uh, gout that's resistant to therapy. Well, I appreciate you joining us here on the program. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thanks a lot, and I really appreciate having this opportunity to speak with you today as well. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download it SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.